So if I can ask Hester if she could um, say some words first um, and get the, the session underway. Of course. Thank you, Phil. Morning, everyone. I thought it would be useful to shed light on how the supply of research is evolving, which affects smaller companies' ability to grow. At Peel Hunt, we believe that thorough analysis and relevant investment research is vital for smaller companies to access equity markets. The research is often the initial point of contact for an investor with the smaller company. Our research team is a center of excellence. We have top-rated analysts, and it's central to our business model. Peel Hunt is corporate broker to 112 listed companies. We advise companies. We speak to 400 investment institutions. We write research on over 300 different UK companies, and we trade 5% of the volume on the LSE daily. So we're in a good position to understand the important role investment research plays for quoted companies and for those companies looking to float. Investment banks and brokers have this flawed business model. We write research, we hand it out for free, and we hope that the buy side will pay us something for it. So at Peel Hunt, we welcome any change which is recognizing that investment research is a valuable service to, that we provide to the buy side. However, when we saw the original draft coming out on MIFID II from the European regulator, which ruled that payment for research could no longer come from uh, the fund managers' uh, dealing commissions, but rather would have to be paid from their own P&L, alarm bells rang. We saw this leading to dramatic negative consequences for small and mid-cap companies. Fund managers would reduce their payments for research. The brokers could no longer write the research as we could no longer pay our analysts. Less investment research would have a dramatic negative impact on the liquidity in smaller company shares, which would increase market volatility and increase the potential for market abuse. In November 2014, Peel Hunt with Extel conducted and published a large survey of fund managers and quoted companies. We wanted to look into the impact of these research payment changes. This we published, you may have seen it, unintended consequences. We had an enormous response. 69 quoted companies and 161 buy-side institutions who represented £1.7 trillion pounds worth of assets under management. The results in this survey highlighted we were not alone in our concerns. I picked out some of the responses which I think are still very relevant for this panel today. 78% of quoted companies saw a correlation between the number of analysts publishing on a company and the liquidity of that company's shares. 77% of the buy-side respondents were already concerned about the falling level of sell-side research on UK smaller companies. 74% of the buy side thought the MIFID II proposals would directly affect the liquidity of UK small cap and AIM stocks. And 84% of the buy side thought the MIFID II proposals would affect the ability of small cap companies to access capital markets in the future. <coughs> we used the results of this survey to lobby hard alongside the QCA with the European regulator on behalf of the UK smaller companies. We highlighted these potential consequences to them. Thankfully, they've backed down, and MIFID II permits that research payments can still be funded out of dealing commissions rather than from the P&L of the fund managers. However, we're yet to hear the final decision from the UK regulator, from the FCA, on what the rules will be in the UK. So breathing a sigh of relief, we thought. However, MIFID II is still driving a big change which affects all UK small and mid-cap companies. Although research can be paid for out of dealing commissions, fund managers now have to set and to tell their clients an annual research budget. This new visibility is driving many fund managers to reduce their research payments. Most of the, large fund, most of the larger fund managers are already MIFID II compliant, and we are seeing these research cuts coming through. In response, some of our competitors are cutting their research teams 
or changing their business model, as the research model is no longer economically viable for them. Independent commission data and independent surveys both are highlighting a growing, growing po polarization between the top brokers, who are winning share of the pay research payment, and the rest. And as a consequence of this, the level of investment research written on small and mid-cap companies is continuing to fall. I'm happy to take questions on this. At the end, I think Phil will be uh, leading the question. Um. Great, thank you, Hester. Um, if I pass to Andy Bruff and ask yep. Andy if he can say uh, a few words about his, uh, his view on the matter. I was, um, I was asked the other day, what do fund managers do now that the Bribery Act has uh, <laughs> come in? And I said to, said to this person, I said, well, um, normally I would have been at Lord's today and uh, getting hold of my morning suit for Ascot next week, but instead I'm speaking at dudes like this. Um, and you know, just picking up on some of the points that Hester raised, you know, research is what fund managers look at, and information is what we're looking for, and we're always on the lookout for information. The problem is there's just so much information around. You know, I think it was Eric Smith who said, you know, in the last two days, there's been as much information created as there has from the dawn of time to 2013. And that research comes from all over the place. You know, I get bigger and bigger broker's notes, which we hardly ever read, and we spend our time actually meeting companies. And so it's the information that companies provide that is key to us. And I think that's going to be key to any investor, be it public or private, uh, going forward. And companies themselves, I think, should be really thinking about what sort of message they're trying to get across to people. You know, people like to complicate information. All we're looking at when companies come in, we want to understand what the inputs into your business are, what you do with them, and then how, what the outputs are. Yeah? Because the world is changing rapidly. And unfortunately for fund managers, you know, information is, is everywhere. And you know, harping back to 1961, uh, when my team Spurs uh, won the double, unfortunately I was only one at the time, and what I now suspect was a once in a lifetime event. I wasn't fully able to celebrate. But the UK market then, if you went back to the UK market in 1961, all the companies had their activities in the UK. You know, Fort Dunlop actually made something. Yeah? It's in the travel lodge. Hawker Siddeley had big factories. And just like Spurs, every member of that Spurs football team came from the British Isles. So you could, as an investor, be it public or private, you could get a view of what was happening just by walking up and down the high street. Now the whole world's changed. And there's that other team in North London, whose name will come to me in a minute, actually, um, Arsenal, who um, have very few English players in their team. And that's what's happened to the UK stock market. Yeah. It's more important for a lot of companies what's happening in China, what's happening in India, what's happening around the globe, what's happening to oil prices, et cetera, et cetera. So as a fund manager or as a private investor, you want to understand what the influences are on a company, and it's down to that company to get that message very clearly across. And if you think about it, really, there should just be a one-to-one -one relationship between the company and the fund manager. But you get a lot of people in the way. You've got investor relations, brokers, analysts, salesmen, corporate advisors, corporate financiers. Yeah. Now, I'm in a one-to-one -one relationship with my wife, and we communicate just with varying degrees of volume, yeah. <laughs> but can you imagine going home and having to go through six different people to get your message across? I mean, after a night out, it might be safer, I accept that, but, you know, it's keeping that message really clear. And what I say to companies is, you know, present to people like myself or present on your website like you'd like to be presented to, like you'd actually like to read it yourself. Because the regulator, as touched on afterwards, is after fund managers in a big way. Yeah. The easy days of just yeah, dealing commissions, long lunches, tragically, have gone. Yeah, we have to justify now why we, how we value a piece of research. It's a bit like trying to nail jelly to the wall. Very difficult. Is it worth five grand? Is it worth 10 grand? No one really knows. All we know is that 
the pressure to actually incur the costs ourselves are growing. Woodford's come out and said he's going to pay his own research bill. Uh, the M&G, legal and general, are looking at it, and one of those has decided to go that way. So it's going to be crucial, if research does decline, that companies really work out how they're going to communicate with their investors. Renishaw, world-leading UK company, said, we've had enough of this. You know, we don't want to go and see fund managers. We don't want to you know, issue quarterly comments. What we're going to do is we're going to have an annual investor day, and you've got to apply for a ticket. Yeah? If you're late, no ticket, you can't come. One of the world's leading engineering companies. Because they took the view, actually, we're going to spend the whole day with people turning up. And they're going to be exposed to all members of the senior management presentations. And they're going to get an understanding of what's going on. And then that could be relayed on the web. And that is the way it's going to go. I am convinced the regulator one day is going to say, I'm um, tragically, Malcolm Darman from TriFast, you can't go and see Andy Bruff on a one-to-one -one basis and say, have a few, they're going up. Yeah? You're now... <laughs> Sorry, but just for the record, Malcolm's never done that, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's that, actually, that information should be available to everyone. And I I'm surprised that more companies don't actually take the AGM and make it a much bigger thing. Yeah? You've got the day, you've got the date in the calendar, why not lay on presentations from your senior management team, invite the analysts up, invite private clients, invite local stockbrokers and fund managers, and that way you are then dis disseminating the information in a sort of regulatory proper way, and everyone is going to be treated equally, because I fear that is the way it's going to go. You know, companies, some of them think, hmm, we'll just use the RNS announcements. You know, if we just issue lots of RNS announcements, we're informing the world of what's going on. But that doesn't always work, does it? Avanti seem to issue uh, RNS announcements about new clients that never arrive. Quindell used to issue announcements about fantastic acquisitions, which actually didn't turn out to be so fantastic. So I think we need less information. We need it more focused. I think we've just got to assume a world where you're not going to have a lot of coverage. Your broker is going to be actually just trading the shares or offering corporate advice, and it's down to you to provide enough information about your company. And I'm surprised that companies don't say at the start of the year, our view is that the range of profitability is between X and Y, with a sort of 10% boundary. And as the year goes on, you might make an acquisition, or you might have a profit warning or whatever, then at least people know. That's all a research note is is a list of estimates which you've provided to the analysts who then pretends that actually they've done them themselves. Yeah? So why not just put that range out and then educate the people about your business? So that's my belief. That's the way it's going. And I'd like to see more companies like Renishaw using that AGM and getting ahead of the curve. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andy. And I'll ask our, our third panellist, Andrew, if, uh, if you could say a few words as well, and then we'll open up to the floor for questions. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'll try and stick to the time, and I'll try and be even as a, more amusing than Mr. Bruff. Um, I'll uh, leave you entirely to discover where the overlap is. I'll just let on right now that he and I have not necessarily uh, compared notes. So, um, uh, and um, I have no idea who Spurs are. Um, but now, I think the first thing to say is that actually growth is a slow process. Um, and one-to-one -one relationships and building them is probably also a slow process. And the reason why I'm a fan of slow growth is simply because, not, not because I've read Gervais's books, um, but simply because actually it creates probably a sustainable record. It creates a record of which ultimately is yours, uh, you can be proud of it, uh, and, and it works all the time, it can't be taken away. Uh, so if you create a sustainable record, it may of course never feel like it on a daily basis, but actually I, I do believe that that does ultimately end up being reflected in a share rating. 
Uh, so a sustainable record is one achieved over considerable time. I remember a certain gentleman um, who ran a company called Mears many, many, many years ago. Um, Mears, of course, fixed houses. They had a contract with the Ministry of Defence. So I guess if you have a Ministry of Defence housing contract, you're always fixing them. But the, um, uh, the chief executive complained about the fact he was going to have to raise some money. And that was at 20p. And he floated his company at 10p. And he didn't think that was good enough progress. Uh, I have to say I'm still a shareholder. Uh, I first paid 11p for my shares. Um, they're now way past four quid, or about four quid. Um, so, 40 times increase in 20 years strikes me as something worth uh, being quite proud of. Um, and thank you very much. 20 years, though, may be a bit long for some of you. Um, I hope you've got that on your side, but I, if it isn't, then of course you can make a few acquisitions, and acquisitions is one way in which you can stimulate growth, um, provided that I think they're carefully and fully explained. Um, I don't know if there are any academics in the room, I'm sorry if there are, um, but you're wrong when you say that acquisitions don't work. Invariably, the academics argue, of course, that, that, that um, there's greater value to the shareholders of the, of the acquired company than there is to the shareholders of the acquiring company. That may be true in big company land. Uh, it may be true for Vodafone or something. I don't think it's actually true for small companies who are struggling with limited uh, product ranges, pr limited services, and need to expand their customer bases. So actually acquisitions carefully and fully explained do work. And there are lots of examples of companies that do that sort of thing all the time and have taken their shareholders with them. You can think of... Um, who can I think of? It's, of course, the embarrassing moment. You think of staff line, uh, you think of a store, you can think of companies that are um, regularly explaining what they're up to and providing a consistent pattern of behavior. And I think if there is one golden rule, as far as I'm concerned, it is that there is a consistent pattern of behavior. Uh, you must remember, and I think Andy referred to this too, you're running a business. You're not a PR agent, you know? And frankly, flim flam and fluff is flim flam and fluff, uh, and you can keep it. Um, a steady flow, moderation in all things, I guess, but a steady flow of consistent information actually is what I think begins to build over time uh, Mr. Bruss one-to-one -one relationship. And I think it's also worth, because not everybody's ever going to always invest in, in your companies, it's also worth, I think, chipping away at investors. And that too, of course, is a slow process. So it's worth being sincere, honest, jargon-free, plain English, all sorts of other good things. And ultimately, I suspect you may get there. I remember sitting through this is a long time ago now. I remember sitting through a tech company's presentation. And after about 30 minutes, much to the embarrassment of my colleague in the room, I turned to the chief exec and said, so what exactly do you do? And we didn't invest. Um, I suppose also, um, for a moment, it's worth saying that there are one or two things that you shouldn't do. I remember holding a telephone out here as some chief executive screamed down the telephone at me. It's happened many times, but this is one I particularly remember. He screamed, oh, I guess it's cheaper than a conference call or something, because all my colleagues could hear what he was saying. Uh, and and uh, the only thing to say is, of course, now that company doesn't exist. And despite his protestations that I would be unbelievably rude by not investing, um, you know, clearly I needed my head examining and all those sorts of comments, the company doesn't exist and, and we, I have to say, didn't invest. Um, there's another story too, because research comes in all sorts of fashions. It comes in all sorts of places. There was another interesting company where, um, and I'm winding the clock back, uh, quite a, a number of years at this point, where a colleague of mine said, oh, yeah, I know his previous employer about this particular finance director. 
So we rang up the employer, asked why this chap had left. Oh, yes, he said, I remember him. It's probably not legal to do this, so I apologise to all the lawyers in the room. Um, the, the, um, we were going to fire him. If he hadn't resigned on the Thursday, we were going to fire him on the Friday. But he beat us to it by 24 hours. It appeared he'd been running his wife's car expenses through the company's books. Uh, and um, so we didn't invest in his new business either. And uh, needless to say, that went bust. Leopards don't change their spots in our view. And uh, of course, that's why it's about behavior. So communication is as much about not only what you're saying and how you're saying it, but the way in which you present it too. And it needs to be, I think, consistent. But let me leave you on one positive note. Um, I think Andy would probably agree. That is that your shareholders can actually be a very real asset to the company's concerns that they're invested in. And I really, really do believe that that is true. There was an occasion where we finally, after many years, this company had been on AIM for five or six years, I persuaded my colleagues that now was the time to invest, and we participated in a fundraising. They sort of boxed me into a corner, and we probably only put in about half of what we might normally invest. We made the investment, and we thought, because there always is another chance to invest, we thought, well, there'll be another chance. That's fine. New contracts, new customers, progress being made, everything as predicted by the chief executive. Life was carrying on hunky-dory. So, whoopee, broker rings up about 18 months later and says, ah, oh, you want the other half of my investment? Not a bit of it. Unfortunately, the company had had an approach. And so he was gonna say, you're gonna have to sell your shares. No, we said, we've got the other half of our investment. Uh, he rings up two other large shareholders, because we weren't certainly the largest, um, and uh, in the space of three telephone calls, he's raised 10 or 11 million pounds. So it goes back to the bidder with this particular news. Um, I suppose the opening price gave us a profit of about 50%. The final price, where we, we sort of followed all the others, gave us a profit of about 90%. So shareholders really can be an asset in all sorts of ways. I suggest you use them. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, some interesting points from all three of our speakers that we can pick up on, hopefully, in questions. Um, if I start the questions off, just picking up on some of the threads that came out of the, the questions um, that you guys voted on first. So question three, websites and annual reports are becoming increasingly important in attracting investors. Um, that was probably the one question that got the, the most decisive answer, with 82% either strongly agreeing or agreeing. Um, and we've seen a lot of change in the last few years in terms of the requirements from the FRC, the code, and the, the inclusions that have to be in companies' annual reports. Um, if I put the question to Andrew and Andy, first of all, um, being uh, fund managers, um, have you seen that the general quality of information that you're getting through those routes is improving, or is there still a long, long way to go? Um, I, I feel sorry for companies, actually, because they... they spend more, a lot of work on annual report and accounts. And the number of fund managers who actually read them is probably very few. Yeah? And it's a shame, really, because you know, I, I'm involved in this thing, Price Waterhouse Building Public Trust for the Future, where we kind of hand out awards for best report and accounts, etc. And it's, you, you look at companies like Provident Financial, who explain to you in three pages how the whole financial system works from their debt collecting with baseball bats to you know, what's happening in the global finance. And everything you need is in that set of report and accounts. And I always say to companies, you know, don't just follow what you did last year. You know, I used to be an auditor, so the easiest tick for me was agreed to last year. Yeah? Go and look at what other companies are doing in other sectors and how they're reporting information. 
and then take that and apply it to, to your own. But you know, it's just looking at report and accounts and trying to get as much information in there without putting too much in there. Yeah? Because a lot of companies, in the risk factor, you know, might start off for one or two or three things, but you know, war in North Korea, stretching it a bit. Yeah? So I just think that the report and accounts is a really key document and, sh and should be marketed more. And that's where that AGM idea came in, really. Andrew, have you a, a view on, on that question? I think, um, in, in my experience, most companies use their report and accounts as a, um, as a marketing document. I, th I suspect that it goes as much to customers as it does to shareholders. Um, and, and to some extent, of course, the content reflects that. Um, it may be that that's a valuable double purpose, one cost, probably you know, decent economies of scale. But um, I think, and, and of course, there's a certain amount of legal enough stuff that has to be in it, um, as you would know. The, uh, the, the, the real issue is, though, um, that most people, I suspect, are slightly frightened um, provident financial may be slightly different. It, it, it frightened of too much content that tells everybody precisely how the company is, is behaving, um, which of course is what investors want to know. Um, so I'm not sure that report and accounts really do do as, as much as they could for the benefit of investors as opposed to all sorts of other people. Thank you, Andrew. And Hester, you do a lot of work with the investor relations societies and other, other bodies similar to that. Uh, is a review from that, that sort of um, interaction as to how companies are improving in terms of their report and accounts, their website communication? Yes. The investment, we do a lot of work with the IR society, particularly focusing on the smaller companies. Um, and a lot of our approach is... is teaching the smaller companies who often don't have an investor relations person themselves how to make life easier for themselves to access the investment community. Um, particularly, our area of strength there is in the wealth management community. We speak to the majority of the wealth managers in England, um, which is often a, um, a quite daunting task for a, for a smaller company to, to look at and, and think, how do I access this huge, um, huge network? Um, and so... Reporting accounts are very important. They can obviously leverage your message out there, as do your webcams, webcasts um, of your AGMs and, and quarterlies and half yearlies. Um, as do we host a lot of um, group meetings where a company can come and, in fact, you're better off really going on to Andy's idea of the, the, the large AGM one day invite everyone. And this is to invite this whole body of wealth managers into a room with you. So it takes you know, an hour of a company's time, um, but you access these, these billions of pounds under management further out. So um, I guess the feedback when we're talking about just the, the publishing material is, yes, that's used a lot in, in all spheres. Um, and we're also talking the economies of scale, but it's the economies of time. So utilising that time better, which, um, as I said, harps back to Andy's idea of, of, of one day, full day of your time to present in, to all investment professionals. Thank you, Hester. Um, do we have questions from the floor, please, for the panel? So here in the front. Thank you. Uh, probably more for Andrew and Andy. Um, what I'm getting increasingly cynical about, I suppose, is the report and accounts gets bigger and bigger, and we're in the process of completing two for ACAL and TRIFAST. A lot of new requirements are being floated in under the guise of best practice. And I think a lot of people are getting befuddled that best practice is actually a rule. I just wondered if I'm being over cynical or whether we should be more more selective to, you know, in differentiating between best practice and what is actually statutorily required. Andy, Andrew? Well, it's, it's quite interesting. If you take the largest company in the UK stock market that is followed by no one, is a company called Mount View Estates with a market cap of £420 million. And its business is very similar 
and the family own 55% of it. And its business is very similar to Granger Trust, regulated tenancies. The Granger Trust report and accounts, 187 pages. The Mountview report and accounts, 70 pages. Why? Because Mountview decide that what is best practice to them is completely different and are not pressurised and beaten up by all the advisors saying, you better put that in, better put that in. Just, you know, I grew up watching, you know, kids' TV, just say no, just say no. Yeah. Don't panic, just say no. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, one of the real reasons to leave Europe is because we can get rid of IFRS and go back to our accounting standards. <laughs> now, I accept that is not going to be a popular vote winner <laughs> on the doorstep. <laughs> Andrew, do you have a view on that? Um, I could add a I, I, I'd agree with the just say no bit. Yeah. Um, so long as, I, I mean, I would argue strongly that consistency should be paramount. And what you think is important, uh, I, you know, given obviously there's a certain legal requirement, uh, but what you think is important is important. Um, and the rest, if you feel like junking it, junk it. Or put it in very small print inside the back cover or something. But, yes, but I, yeah, I think they are concerned. Yeah. And I um, well, there is. On, uh, on the Building Public Trust Awards panel, where I'm the only investor, and the rest of them are sort of tree-hugging, guarding-reading people, they love things like that, right? But they don't run the money. I couldn't give a monkeys. Yeah. <laughs> so t taking that a step further in terms of we look, you know, we've spoken about reporting accounts and, and, and inclusion and best practice and pushing back against advisors who are suggesting that content you know, increases and widens. Um, Andy's comment on uh, the, the amount of information that is currently right. available. Um, social media is obviously becoming much more prevalent and websites have been around for that bit longer and the report has translated into information on websites. Um, in terms of your um, uh, research and your um, knowledge gathering, how, how reliant are you on social media? How much importance do you put on sort of social media and in information that you gather from social media? Andrew? I, I don't put any because I don't gather any. Uh, I'm far, yeah, I leave that to my younger colleagues and they tell me what they've discovered. Um, I wouldn't know where to begin, frankly. Um, but... Um, it, it, to the extent that it can have some share price impact, yes, of course it's important. Um, chat rooms, whatever else, um, do have some relevance. Correctly or, or incorrectly, they do have some relevance. Um, and, and certainly, uh, from the point of view of managing a reputation, it must be important. Uh, from the point of view of trying to manage a share price, it clearly has some bearing. Uh, from the point of view of do I personally look at it, as I say, I wouldn't know where to begin. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, no, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of uh, things like Interactive Investor because you know, the, the private investor is much better uh, informed now because of the whole social media thing. And there's someone on that site who probably knows what's going on. So... One of my biggest holdings is a company called Dart Group, Jet2.com. And Castleford Tiger is his name on the Dart website. And he knows everything before it comes to the market. So, you know, why not follow him? Yeah. Thank you. Um, not, not here, is he? <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have any more questions from the floor, please? Just here in the front, please. <coughs> The concept of market expectations is heavily embedded in um, the way the market operates. And, and Andy, you got very close to exposing the myth of what market expectations are. Um, if research retrenches back to in-house institutions, what becomes of market expectations? And is there a risk of a trend towards where some of the uh, smaller markets, particularly in the Far East, where they are actually introducing the concept that companies 
as Andy suggests, actually publish prospective information. But that then runs, runs contrary to some of the regulation and the takeover panel, et cetera, we have over here that we don't make profit forecasts. So how do you reconcile what's happening with the myth of market expectations? Well, it always makes me laugh, actually, when a company comes out and says, announces their results and says, we've beaten market expectations. Well, if, if I gave you the number, then of course I'm going to beat it. I've got to be a complete idiot, haven't I? Not, not, not to beat it. Um, I, I think, you know, from your analyst's point of view, you know, it's far easier to ask the FD what the, bottom, what the number is in the bottom right-hand corner and try and prepare a spreadsheet and come up with it yourself. Yeah? Yeah. And so I would rather companies said, this is the range. This is our, our, our range. This is what we're going to grow out. Our KPIs are, you know, we're looking for organic growth. Rather than say, we're trying to minimize our footprint around the world, this is what we're trying to aim to do. And these are the KPIs, which would then replace, if you like, the, the risk factors. And the risk is that they're not going to meet them. And so it picks up Malcolm's point that simplifies it down. So if you say try fast, if you had sort of five things, it might be organic growth, acquisitions, return on capital, return on equity, dividend growth. These are the range, and then people will get comfortable. So it's not just one number, because you know the amount of fiddling that goes on with accounts. Oh please, you know, here we are. Underlying earnings, statutory earnings. Guess which people want their bonus based on, right? So again, let's just simplify it and stop playing games, and then that would create a lot more trust across the whole investment community and take away the cynicism that most people feel. I guess part of the point is that you're talking to are the shorter term expectations, the, 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 the next six months or the next year, and where analysts do add both your analysts and your team and analysts on the, on the, um, on the sales side can add value is their expectations for the next three to five years. Where is this company going to be? Is it going to be a doubler? Is it going nowhere? Um, and using their own experience and basically putting themselves on the line to say, this is what I believe. Um, because companies don't give out their forecast, their expectations for the next five years. They'll, they'll look at a model and say, yeah, your next, your next six months is probably about right, but not their next five years. So I think you probably have to look at it in two different time frames. Thank you. Any, any more questions from the floor? No, no hands. Oh, there's one here. Thank you. Just picking up on that last point, I'm concerned that uh, you think that we can forecast out to five years. Um, I really struggle to forecast out six months with any degree of accuracy. Um, a year is a bit of a random guess, but is, is properly manageable. Two years in the current time frame environment is, is, is um, uh, impossible. Uh, uh, five years, uh, don't even think about it. Um, you know, so much can happen, especially in small coated companies, um, that you know, putting a number out for five years, you're just creating hostages to fortune because so much can change. Well, let's, let's, let's take, a, let's take a, a, a topical example. Mike Ashley. Yeah. I designed that bonus scheme for him. And he, that bonus scheme was set out on the basis that he had to hit a certain target of profit, but you had to do it by keeping gearing down so you couldn't effectively buy your profitability. And it was a target what it was going to be in three years' time. He had no idea, but the staff said, OK, that's the target, let's go for it. And everyone won. So setting targets, actually, and putting them in the public arena with a payout, not just to you know, the top people, but throughout the organisation, can actually benefit everyone, because everyone's on the same journey then. It's not just the people at the top, is that everyone's on the same journey. I changed the tack slightly. Um, one of the points that we were covering off was about research and about the changes brought in by MIFID uh, and the requirements around research. Um, and uh, Hester, you commented that in your survey there was a very, uh, very much a view that uh, the changes would impact for small companies the availability of, of research. 
Um, it, can, can we just explore that a bit more and, and, and how we think that that really is going to impact people that are in this room and their ability to get their message out? And actually, you know, should smaller companies now be taking much more responsibility, picking up on the points about the one-to-one -one, uh, relationship, the quality of information that they are providing? Um, is this actually an opportunity for, for companies to take much more control of that relationship than perhaps has been the, the norm in the past? Yeah, I'd say that it's not just an opportunity, it's going to be a necessity. In many cases, our research team writes, they're one of two or three analysts writing on a company. In some cases, we're the only house writing on a company, um, writing research, putting out forecasts on a company. Um, I think, you know, 15 years ago, there were probably, and you'll know better, 25 different mm. research houses on UK small mid cap. You know, now you can count them on one hand. Um, and that's because the, the economic business model is not viable anymore for most of them. So there's been a lot of M&A um, or people closing down. Um, as you said, there are some companies that are not written on at all. And then you're open to, you need to be able to out, be out there and putting out your own message. Or there's a lot of the chat rooms um, which are, are, are moving stocks around. And in those cases, we make markets in, in all stocks aim stocks up to FTSE 100 stocks and it's the aim stocks with no coverage that we see very high market volatility in um, and as I said within the survey we, we highlighted that the worse that volatility gets then the market opens for abuse. Andrew, Andy, I, I know we, you made some comments already about um, your relationships with investors but... Well you, t you, asked me, you asked me in the green room didn't you what... what um, what I knew about MIFID too, and I said it was some sort of insect. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a company producing good numbers, investors will find you. So you know, when I started off in 1987, you know, four, four houses really controlled the London market. Yeah? Schroeder's, UBS, Gart No More, and M&G Peru. That was it. And we had about 30% of the equity. Yeah. And so if you wanted a deal done, hardly any research was written then, wasn't it? You know, so if you wanted a deal done, you just went to see these, these, the four big, five big players. Now, completely fragmented. So I, people would phone me up from America to talk about an AIM company, all right? Because they've got two or 3% of it, and we might have 20% of it. Shares do well. All the brokers then think we better go and follow this one and cover it. So you know the fragmentation of that base means that the investors are using other things. They're looking at trends. They're understanding how businesses work. They're reading your report and accounts. They're looking at the website and they come to a view. They're not necessarily talking and reading the brokers' research. And that's why I think you know this idea of actually trying to provide the same level of information to everyone is going to make your life easier and actually improve the transparency. It might lead to you know, bigger volatility in the stock market, but you know, it's a casino anyway, so you know, that's not going to change. Andy? <laughs> Andy, do you have a view on that as well? Uh, yeah, I, I would think that um, that may be true, Mr. Bruff, at uh, your end of the large cap market. Um, where, of course, it is a casino. Um, but if you're investing in tiny little businesses, um, can be a casino, but on the whole, I suspect it's more of an investment. Um, and most people, I say most people, by which I mean probably most institutions, and, and many private individuals are there for several years. Um, that, I suspect, is more in the realms of an investment that, than, mm. uh, than a gamble or a casino. Um, there will always be day traders. There's always room for day traders. There's always room for people who want to take a turn. And even someone who makes a long-term investment and then you know, something happens, so they've got to sell it. Um, that's just life. But I think on the whole, at, at the very tiny end, people are actually making investments ra rather than behaving as if they're uh, in a casino. Um, so I, yeah. Yeah, I, I just think that there are those people out there actually to be used by companies more. Um, if they can find some way of tapping into that resource, then um, they, they've got something to use that it, at the moment is very largely uh, go, going unused. Okay. So, 
Tim, did you? Do you see uh, private investors as a source of liquidity? And if so, how do you change companies' views from seeing them as an irritant? I don't know how you do the second bit. Um, but yes is the answer, a resounding yes, they are um, a source of liquidity. Um, and to some extent, uh, I'm talking to another fund manager on this very subject two or three weeks ago, um, and they said he, he was of the view that they were an irritant. Uh, and I said, well, it's just because they're selling when you're selling, and the same is true of M&G or you know, wh whoever it may be, um, to which he had to admit that the answer was yes. Um, so, you know, where, where everybody's trying to do the same thing, or, or many, many shareholders are trying to do the same thing, and there are no sellers or there are no buyers, whichever you're trying to do, um, yeah, it, it's going to be a problem. And, and yeah, M&G can be just as irritating as, as Fred Smith, um, but they are definitely a source of liquidity. And, and certainly from a perspective of aim, you wouldn't want to be without them. Tim, perhaps I can add on that as well. Um, from our own experience, you know, we certainly don't see smaller investors, private investors, as being an irritant. You know, we have quite an extensive programme where we go out and visit people outside of London, private client brokers, you know, um, uh, investors across the country. Um, and, and we see that as being very valuable. I mean, just um, completed an equity raise our existing private you know, investor base took up 30% of the, of, of the equity raise. Um, I don't know what the views are of other companies that are here in the room, but we certainly don't see them as being irritant. Um, and I think the vote at the outset was pretty, pretty evenly split between yes or no in terms of that one. Com co companies see all shareholders as an irritant when they're selling their shares. Right. Full stop. They love you, whoever you are when you're buying them, they hate you when you're selling them. Yeah. I sometimes have to remind companies then when they're saying, why are you selling the shares? I say, well, I thought you were going to ask that question. So just before the meeting, I popped into HR and I looked up my job description. It said, fund manager, buys and sells shares. <laughs> I'd, I'd add to that. Um, at Peel Hunt, we, we've got a, a part of our business it's in the equity market side, and it's retail equity markets. Um, and over the last two years, we've built this business. And we now, in equity share raisings, we will um, place a chunk of that, as the company wants, with the wealth management arm into that whole, it's a huge amount of money out there of these private investors, which is managed, rolled up under larger institutions. So when it comes to the wealth managers, we don't find them irritating to deal with at all. They're, they're, it's like dealing with an, a, 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 well, a, a normal investment in, institution. Um, and they, in, in fin equity finance raises, they act in exactly the same way. And we work with them in exactly the same way. And we've had some very successful equity raisings with that. And companies have been, have been delighted with it. Um, equally as I said before, going to see the wealth managers doesn't need to be a, an onerous burden. I think people sometimes, you think about individual investors and you think about the, the lady that's ringing up because she's got two shares and she wants to be able to sell them and who should she sell the three, two or three shares to, whereas the majority of private investors now do sit under the wealth management umbrella. Thank you. Um, so we've got just a few minutes now before you guys are going to want to go and have some lunch. So are there any other questions from, from the room? Uh, one at the very back. Uh, this, is, this is for Andy Bruff and any of the others who care to comment. Um, what's the role of gut feeling in um, buy, sell or hold decisions? Sorry, could you say that again? I'll be dead. What's, what's the role of gut feeling? You, you analyse the balance sheet and all the numbers and you speak to the, uh, the company? It's um, a gut feeling is something you used when the compliance officer said, why did you buy those shares just before they were taken over? <laughs> 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 no. Um, 
it, it comes out, it's a point that Hester made about sort of body language and, uh, and all these sort of things. You know, the gut feeling, I would say, is, is sort of experience. You know, Andrew is talking about that body language as well, meeting yeah. people. Sometimes the numbers just don't add up. You know, or you meet a company and you don't understand really what they do. You know, and quite often I'll say to companies, tra tragically, we're both fluent but in different languages. Yeah? I don't really understand. And that can, I could call that gut feeling as well. I think I met four companies yesterday, but if you just take two as an example, um, where he's shareholders in both of them, and, and the first you come out wringing your hands, dead frustrated. Um, the management team were secretive, um, they didn't necessarily have the greatest news to impart, but certainly they, they, they left you with the feeling that they were hiding something. Um, and the next one came out dead friendly. I don't think we even followed the sort of PowerPoint presentation, but we talked about various issues and sorted out the world at large. And you come out thinking somehow, those guys, I could trust to get it right even mm -hmm. if the world throws a bomb at them. Um, and so there's an, yeah, gut feeling plays a part, um, and it's about the one-to-one, -one, it's about the behaviour in your one-to-one -one relationship uh, that, that really does ultimately build the trust that Andy's been talking about. Um, and, and it is, there is an element. Um, you, you get the feeling that if a company keeps all its information to itself, not prepared to trust shareholders, probably not prepared to trust the staff, what are you doing there? Great, thanks. You. Just, just, just to wrap this up, um, I'll put each of you on the spot um, for the final question. Um, examples of companies that communicate well, so something that everybody here can take away with as perhaps a reference point of one thing or one company that does something particularly well that could actually become best practice or could actually be something that could be valuable to all the companies in this, in this room that, that are looking for your investment. I, I, I would just get hold of the accounts of those companies on the short list of building public trust awards. You know, there's only six. Uh, you know, people like Provident Financial, Great Portland, Shanks, because they only really do 350, and just look at what they're doing and how they're presenting and how they're telling people their story and see what you can learn and how you could apply it to your own company. Esther? My answer is on based on I, I see companies when they come in, but I also get a lot of feedback from the fund managers who've, who've seen the companies. Um, there's a particular company who is constantly being picked up as, as one of the best in investor relations. It's an international company. It, it's got issues at the moment with um, the payout of its, of its um, senior executive, um, but WPP's IR team always get very highly ranked and they're head of investor relations. Um, and that's because he's very open and approachable. People say they can get hold of him at any time. He's happy to take a call, happy to have a meeting, happy to travel up to the north of England to go and see a smaller wealth manager who he has got an important position for them in, in his firm. Um, so I think it's that openness and approachability um, adds to the fact he's obviously got years of experience behind him, but that's the feedback that I get, the differentiating factor. Okay, and Andrew, final word. Yeah, oh dear, one of, one of responsibility, and I'm keeping you from lunch. Um, I can think of two that actually always talk about their industries fully. Uh, one is um, the weird and wacky NWF, Northwest Farmers, um, and always talks about the weather agriculture and the impacts that all sorts of policy changes are having on their, um, their, their business. And the other, in similar ways too, um, although I probably shouldn't mention it because it's a client of Peel Hunt, and that is Breeden Aggregates. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of our session. Um, I'd like to thank Hester, Andy and Andrew for, uh, for taking part and for taking your questions and answering them so well. Um, and go and enjoy your lunch. Thank you.